yeah, I think their champion pool, uh, what they, you know, what they have in their champion pool really makes them a scary team. Hi everyone, it's Tom with another MSI ramp up interview and with me here to talk all about the LCO, the Oceanic region. Is Juice a caster for the region? Juice, thank you very much for joining me. How are you doing? Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm doing well. It probably, people probably think, why is this guy got a jacket on? But it is pretty cold at the moment. So <laughs> um, I just got home, so I'm trying to warm up. In Australia, it's 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 almost impossible to imagine it being cold there. <laughs> Uh, if you're from Melbourne, which is where I'm from, <laughs> it is cold. If you're from Sydney and Queensland and whatnot, it's just always warm and sunny. So gotcha. I just uh, I are indeed the wrong the wrong state. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, again, thank you so much for joining me to talk about uh, Pentanet GG, who are the representatives heading into MSI for uh, yeah for for the LCO. Now, before we talk about the team itself, I think a uh, few people will know what the state of the region is at the moment. Obviously, Riot discontinued the OPL at the end of last year, and now it's uh, the LCO hosted or organized by ESL Australia. Um, and Oceanic players are now basically be able, like eligible to be picked up by teams like in the LCS. I think they count as residents there immediately. So yeah. can you give people a quick update on the state of the region after that update and what it looked like now? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, the LCO has just been like a, a saving grace. Like it's been amazing. Um, just in terms of professionalism, in terms of broadcast, in terms of everything. Um, yeah, I honestly can't speak highly enough of like the, the product that, that we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. But it's also nice that the players uh, that, because we had a big exodus, right? Like so many players went overseas to the LCS, to, to the academy, and, and they've done extremely well uh, overseas. Uh, but then it's left like the next group or the next batch of players that kind of uh, needed a little bit of direction. So it's provided that extra, like, I guess the extra motivation, the extra resources um, and the tools for these, uh, you know, the next generation of players that uh, Oceania has to take the same step as the players that have just gone, like FBI, King, Destiny, Shurnfire, all those guys. Mm. So um, in terms of, yeah, we're in like a very, very good developmental stage where there's a lot of young players coming up that are taking similar trajectories to those players that have left. Right, and as we talk about uh, Penta and GG, obviously um, the, all the teams in the region now have to form new teams without the big names that went overseas. So heading into the spring split, did Pentanet have any big shakeups in the roster as well? Yeah, so uh, like it's funny because you know you look at overseas rosters and you think of like maybe I don't know whoever you follow G two uh, Fnatic, you think of Hundred Thieves, you know Team Liquid Cloud Nine. They all have like a few players in which they build the roster around. Mm -hmm. Whereas like in our region, it's there's certain players who 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 change teams, but there's never like a there's never it's not stable enough to have like the same player on the same roster every year or mm -hmm. every split and then build around that. But Pentanet were the guys who, who honestly, they were almost best in slot for all of their roles once everyone left. And I mean, if you're best in slot player uh, and, and you're just communicating and playing solo queue, it's inevitable you're going to end up on the same team. And uh, Pentanet, were, they went very hard for particular players like the mm -hmm. likes of Pabu, the likes of Chaz, who were very good. And most players want to play with them. So, you know, once you're the name that everyone wants to play with, that's kind of how that team, I guess, you know, uh, you know, made its way. Mm -hmm. and, and can you say that Pentanet sought to build a this core, which is maybe a bit unusual in in uh, the LCO or in, in the region, that they now are trying to build a core that people want to play with? Or is this just, okay, for this year, we're going to try it with this way? No, I think Pentanet are really smart. I think it's, it's they actually got the best of both worlds. They got arguably some of the most marketable players our mm -hmm. region has. Like, but I mean, I'm pretty sure most people who watch this no Pabu because he tweets so much and he's got yeah. a lot of European fans <laughs> and whatnot. Um, but like, you know, in terms of an identity, in terms of a core, I would say like Pabu is a very big part of that. Chaz is going to be a bit, very big part of that. Bio Panther as well. I, it honestly feels like a roster that potentially if none of them get picked up, which I think potentially some of them do overseas, okay. but if none of them do, this is probably a core we see for years to come. Um, if, they're, if they're able to, you know, ride the momentum of doing well at MSI, coming back, winning, going to Worlds. And I think they do stick together. So I think Pentanet have done a very good job in picking up skill, marketable talent, and, and, and just putting it all together. And, and it's really worked for them thus far. Yeah, and um, with this roster, and obviously the other teams had to do their own 
shakeups and new formations as yeah. well. So heading into the split, what were the expectations for this roster? Where did they rank? Did you expect them to win the split or do super well? Or yeah, what did it look like for you? Honestly, first few weeks, or maybe even before the first game was played, I was probably a little bit harsher on the Pentanet roster uh, in terms of maybe previous biases or my previous opinions of, of players. Mm -hmm. Not that I didn't think they would be like one of the best teams in the league, mm -hmm. but there was, you know, there's teams like Peace, teams like Dyers. We had, we had basically rosters that had veterans who have won the league before. They've won the, the Oceanic title before, and therefore I thought they would be better suited. Or by the end of the split, they would have overtaken Pentanet, right. I thought. I thought Pentanet might have been better at the start, but then the, the veterans would overtake them once they got a few matches under their belt. But Pentanet just went from strength to strength to strength to strength in terms of like, you know, I thought maybe, okay, maybe their laning would, would be a weakness against this team. But then they would just shore that up and they'd have a stronger laning phase. Maybe they wouldn't be as uh, uh, better in the macro department coming up against a team with like Direwolves with all the veterans. However, they completely outplayed them in a macro department. So anytime I kind of questioned them or doubted them, they just shut it down real quick and they went 13 and zero uh, up until the final game. So they didn't even lose a game for the whole split. So they quickly diminished any of that doubt. Uh, but I think, you know, to go 13 and zero, it's not that it's an overperformance, mm -hmm. but it's, that's a ridiculous run in any yes. league. It doesn't matter what <laughs> league you're playing yes. in. Um, so... Yeah, I think uh, I think they, they their name was in the mix for a top three, top four finish, but they they completely just it was a shutout. Like they were just the best team by far all year. Yeah, and and you speak a bit about their development as a team. Was that something that just clicked at the start, or did you still see progress of them performing as a team? You know, even if you win the first matches, it can still look maybe it was a close match or still it looked shaky or rough at a few matches, and in the end it looks clean. How was that for Pentanet? Well, they actually, in their first game of the split, I remember that they said that they were going to win before 20 minutes. And I thought, okay, these guys are just, <laughs> these guys are like, what, what, are they, what are they saying? They actually won the game in 19 minutes. Well, um, yeah. In, in the first week, yeah. <laughs> and um, no, but in terms of their development, I think where they really improved and where you started to notice a difference was if our t at the teams in our region, the top two, top three teams would have like a two or three K gold lead mm. uh out of laning phase. And that's a pretty significant, like you should be able to do something with that. You should be able to win if you have like a 3K lead yeah. or at least at least take it like, like at least make a meal of the game or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, even with a 3K gold lead, Pentanet were just good enough in terms of team fighting, in terms of macro, in terms of finding the pick, in terms of setting up around the objective to, to not only like reduce the deficit, but just in one play, get the Baron, get a few turrets, and just be ahead gold. <laughs> it almost just felt like if you were 3K ahead, it wasn't enough. And I think that's where they improved. They just improved as a team in terms of playing the map and setting up around objectives. Like laning phase, whatever. Like they were one of the best anyway. But mm -hmm. in, terms of, in terms of being just resilient and hard to shut out and being able to just finish games with the lead but also come back from a deficit, they really, I mean... They, they got to a point where it was like, okay, th yeah, like I said, 3K, not enough. You need to be 5 or 6K up out of lane to actually beat them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mm -hmm. um, when we talk about uh, the development of the team, obviously when the playoffs hit and uh, things started to transition from best of one into uh, best of five scenarios, sometimes that changed for teams, but this wasn't the case for Pensionet. They just stayed same way, same strategy, and kept, kept winning? I think best of five actually suits Pentanet more than a best of one. Uh <laughs> um, just because... Uh, they have very big champion pools. Mm -hmm. And so if something doesn't work, they can flip the script. They can go for something else, right? They can change top lane pick. Pabu in particular can play an abundance of champions. And I think it helped him that he actually was a top laner beforehand because now he has this really diverse champion pool. Mm -hmm. And he's also, I don't know, again, if you follow him on Twitter, but he tweets all the time about like crazy jungle champs and parts and everything. And he he's that guy, like he's going to do that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, coming up against RNG, uh, they'll have a like they'll have a strategy, but we won't we won't even be able to guess because they're just so you know forward thinking, open minded, and I think that's why they're so good is because they're open mindedness. They're ape, they're willing to let each other try stuff. Doesn't work, okay? We'll go back to the drawing board. But mm -hmm. that's why I think a best of five suits them yeah. um, because they will do that. They'll take the risk in the best of five, uh, and and if it doesn't work, they'll go to something else. So yeah, I think their champion pool, uh, what they you know what they have in their champion pool really. Makes them a scary team. 
Yeah, um, and, and you already touched on MSI now. Obviously, the group stage, um, the, the initial stage, and then the rumble stage will all be best of one. And uh, if mm. Pentanet makes it to the semifinal, then they'll get to to a best of five. But um, I think it's safe to say that hopes, internationally speaking, aren't really high for the uh, for the LCO champions to to make it that far. But they are in a group with only uh, three teams in total. They are with RNG mm. and Unicorns of Love. So statistically uh, speaking, they have the highest chances of making it out of at least that initial stage. How, what is your perspective on this? I think RNG is one of the tournament favorites. Then Unicorns of yeah. Love obviously made it out of play-ins last year at Worlds and to the group stage. So what's your perspective on Pentanet's odds um, this MSI? Look, uh, you know, the O's fan in me obviously says, yeah, we can do it because I think we we always have the underdog mentality where like every tournament we've gone into, we think we can do it. This is the year. This is the year. However, obviously against RNG, um, you would assume <laughs> RNG have that one wrapped up. Like RNG <laughs> are, are going to be able to, you know, win that one. Mm -hmm. But I was actually more concerned about the VCS. I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the Vietnamese League of Legends is really good. I, I did go there for uh, a short while, played some League of Legends there as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you, they have talents like Levi and whatnot. And I thought they would actually give more trouble to Pentanet. And obviously Unicorns of Love, I'm not trying to say that it's going to be an easy game by any means. They're still favorites, of course. But, um, yeah, I just... It's probably just the Australian in me, just the, the oceanic man in me that thinks that they have a very good chance of upsetting you, you, uh, Unicorns of Love just because of the way Pentanet play the game mm -hmm. and because no lead is safe. Because Pentanet aren't the type to just roll over. They'll mm -hmm. take the game to 40 minutes, to 45 minutes if they can. Um, so, hey, you know, I think, yeah, like it's, it's obviously uh, RNG probably favourites, Unicorns of Love probably slot in second, Pentanet third, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm very optimistic that Pentanet are going to, to be able to upset or at least put on a good show because, you know, like we touched on before, the region is kind of in that phase where a lot of good players have gone overseas mm -hmm. and we're bringing up the next batch of players who, who are going to do our region proud, who are probably going to be overseas and be our next representatives. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, they can put on a good show and and say hey like you know we're here and and we're going to put up a contest yeah um we are i also want to touch on the, the the weaknesses and the strengths of the team that we we have to look out for so what what you keep an eye on and let's start just with the weaknesses from what i've heard you say this team developed a lot during the spring split and became a very well-rounded team very versatile in what they can do especially also with their champion pools but at msi what could be a hurdle for this team um, aside from maybe when you, you know, maybe a bit crudely put it like individual level where a team like mm. RNG is probably going to rank higher oh, yeah, yeah. than, than, way, than, yeah, many the, higher. than many of the teams <laughs> of, of, yeah. the, of the team, right? So other than individual I mean, strength, as a team, what is a weakness for, for Pentanet? And I think uh, this is, you touched on it, and this is probably a weakness that, Os that Os has had every single international tournament we've had, but it's just the laning phase. Just mm -hmm. being being able to come out of lane at a play where, at a place where you can play the game, like uh, you know, and this is why I'm optimistic against Unicorns of Love because whilst they're they're they you know they're really really good in their own right, but um you know there's levels to the game right like RNG going to be contesting for winning MSI, uh, and yeah I think Pentanet probably would struggle the most in lane against teams like RNG. It is going to be hard to come out of lane, play your matchups how they're meant to be played. And therefore, your jungle is going to, to suffer early on, right? Like, you know, no priority in any of the lanes. You lose your crab, you lose your jungle camps. All of a sudden, you're playing at a deficit and it is going to be hard. But um, yeah, in terms of their strengths, their strengths for me lie within uh, their, their, their shot calling, their macro, how they're able to, they're really willing to leave a top wave or get a lead topside, transition that into... Biopanther is their top laner, if anyone doesn't know that's watching. Uh, transitioning that into Biopanther, grouping to the objective, grouping to the dragon, and just forcing a 5v5 team fight because they're, they're, they're just really good at the setup. They're really right. good at getting there, getting the pick, or starting the fight. And so that's what I would keep my eyes on is like even at a deficit or, or ahead, see how they set up because they're willing to take the fight nine times out of ten. They almost play like an LPL team, right? They, they're coming down. <laughs> they're going for the eight-minute Rift Heralds. They're fighting. They're going for the dragons and they're fighting. So it's actually pretty exciting to see like Stylistically, they probably match up very well against these teams. It's just going to be like eight-minute team fights at five v five at Rift Herald. <laughs> right, and uh, that is 
you you also touched on the strength now, their 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 fighting ability. You you've mm. also mentioned the the champion pool. But is there anything particular that you think? Okay, this is really where this team shines compared to other teams at MSI as well. Look, I think that most teams, most teams have a star, right? Mm -hmm. Like they have a star player. They have like the the one player that you could focus on. Uh, if I use Gigabyte Marines as an example, it would be Levi. Um, if I use you know RNG as an example, well, they're probably just all around the board extremely good. But <laughs> uh, like you know, team, people are very uh, excited about Xiaohu in the top lane there. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then also like you know, you think about Cloud Nine then, and then you think, well, who on Cloud Nine perks, right? Um, so. Pentadet don't necessarily have that. Not because anyone's weak, but mm -hmm. because they've all, they're just a good team. Like, mm -hmm. they just all do their job extremely well. Like, the guy who got MVP, Biopanther, played tanks all year. You got MVP <laughs> playing tanks. Like, he didn't play any, ca like, normally the MVP is playing Camille, playing Fiora, playing something, like, those type of champions. But when your tank is MVP, like the front to back must mean something, right? Like right. your front to back team fights must mean something. So, I mean, they've all had their moments. Like, uh, it, it's so hard to call, but if I just had to say one person, who do you want to focus on? For me, it's Pabu, because every time he gets ahead or gets a lead, he's willing to take the risk, he's willing to make the dive, and he's willing to sack himself to get his team a lead, to get Chaz a lead, to get his bot lane a lead. So I'd keep my eyes on him if I had to. All right, Juve, thank you so much for joining me. We're going to keep an eye on uh, on Pabu, but in on Pentanet in general, especially. I'm very excited to see. You mentioned the big champion pool. I always, I, I always like minor regions, especially we saw in the playing stage last year at Worlds as well. Interesting picks that we wouldn't see in the group stage, but it made, made it exciting. So uh, you, you, you've definitely sold me on that part. Again, thank, yeah. you. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for, for joining me, and I hope you enjoy MSI, man. Yeah, thank you. And uh, maybe we'll watch a game together. I would love so, yes. Yes. <laughs>